great. Okay, well, we're, we're on church planting and how to pace a church plant. Um, first thing I'd like to say, first of all, I guess, is that I commend all of you who are looking at church planting, being prepared for it, training for it. I just think uh, that's a wonderful thing. And uh, this nation still needs uh, massive waves of church planting. So before I get into pace of a church plant, uh, just got a couple of pre-thoughts almost. Um, um, and that is the Bible's quite clear that it is that we plant and we water, but it is actually God who gives the growth. And um, we can start off with our uh, plants and we can do the planting and we can have intentions and ideas about what that's going to be. In the end, God gives the growth, and uh, we always need to lean heavily towards that. That means that, that God doesn't need to be capped by our expectations either. He can, he can um, allow things and does allow things to grow. So we can plant and water, but he's the one who makes things grow. Uh, the second thing to say is that I personally believe that uh, church planting is not an exact science. Uh, it doesn't have a series of fixed formulas. I think there's... Um, for us, we would regard it much more like there's, there are obviously some guiding principles, which I will be sh sort of just sharing a little bit with tonight. Um, but uh, inevitably, there are um, different ways to plant different sorts of churches. Therefore, and this is my point really, is that the pace will vary from plant to plant. There are different sorts of plants. Uh, if I was just to turn into gardening mode for a second, you can plant a seed or you can plant a, a sapling, uh, or, or you could plant a small uh, um, shrub or a small tree. So, sorts of plants, and I do believe there's a different sense of pace around um, those different kinds of plants. Um, so let me try and unpack that a little bit. Now, I tend to think in threes. So if that sounds a little trite to you, it's just because I am basically quite Trinitarian. And uh, I kind of can only think in threes. So if I come up with three this, three that, three that, that's the way I think. So let me just think about this for a minute. There are, in our experience, um, three factors that um, affect um, a plant. And they could affect it in one way or another. The first is, is its location. And uh, by that, I mean uh, some understanding or understanding about what the focus of the plant is. What is the community that we're planting into? What is the catchment of that, the location of it? And um, they are going to be quite different. If you're planting into a city and you're looking for a city centre kind of plant, that will be quite different and it will involve different sorts of uh, preparation and so on than a kind of small plant into a possibly a smaller community or a, a small town. So inevitably there's a sense of which uh, the location makes a big difference. We here planted a church, um, one of our churches here, uh, into Leicester four years ago. And I'll talk a little bit more about that because the intention of that was uh, that it would be a city plant, uh, which was different to ones that we planted in small towns around uh, near Derby. Uh, and so the intention of it becomes quite different. The location, the focus, and the catchment, I think, is quite important. The second factor um, for us is, is proximity. And again, it's like, how far away is this plant from the sending church or the planting church? Um, one of our less successful stories, really, is that uh, a number of years ago, we planted a church from Derby into Glasgow, as you do. Uh, we happened to have a, a, a couple of folks here who were from Glasgow. They were really keen to go, and we said, great, okay, off you go, and we'll try and do our best to support you. Really, it worked for a little while, and then it kind of petered out. And I guess we um, we felt afterwards what was the problem there, and the real issue was proximity. It was so far away from that we. Uh, so, in one sense, you could say this: the closer, the better. Um, and um, uh, to be close means that there's quite a higher level of support. Although this isn't totally true today, because I think with increased technology, with increased communications, 
the potential to give higher level support to places that are out, kind of that's reducing a little bit, I would suggest. So location, proximity, and the third factor that will affect the plant is actually the personnel. Uh, what kind of people, what kind of leader um, are we planting? What, what's their experience? What's their level of maturity? What's their uh, as a leader? So the leader themselves is obviously quite a key person in a church plant. Uh, but also that team, if there's a team going with them, uh, the team is very important as well. And the chemistry of that team we found to be quite uh, critical. Um, so um, again, we've, uh, we've often found that when we've started to look to plant a church somewhere and we look to see who would go with them, we find a leader and then we find a whole lot of people that are thinking they might like to go. Um, and then there's a bit of sifting that tends to take place that uh, kind of like sifts out some of those folks. But actually that's quite a good process because after what you're after really is the right people um, and, and the right chemistry there. So let's just look at um, actually planting now. Um, I don't know how you've been uh, taught up to now. I broadly got, guess what, three, three stages that I think are inevitable in a church plant. And they are simply these, the preparation, the plant itself, and then I should have another P, but actually, and then I call it the launch, the launch. Uh, so the preparation is the clarity of sense of where we're going, where the plant is going to go. Uh, it's the preparation of the planters, the people who are going to go will be part of that. Um, and obviously there's a season or a period of time which we just call the preparation. Then there is the plant. That is actually people arriving, beginning to form, community being begun to be established in a place. Now, for us, that doesn't necessarily equate to the launch. In fact, we often encourage it to be a period of time where some things are, are begun to work out, where a little bit of communities begin to be formed, but simply where people actually can arrive, move in, and so on. Often that period of time is a little bit underground or behind closed doors. And then when it's appropriate and uh, appropriate time, then would come the launch, which is uh, where things go a little bit more public, where things are a bit more visible, where there's a defined, if you like, beginning. Now, we're going to talk about pacing these things, the pace. So, um, the answer, of course, is um, the pace varies. <laughs> it varies according to the sort of plant, the situation that we're talking about. And so, I just thought what I'd do is I'll give about three examples, three examples, um, of different sorts of plants and just see that actually the pace might be quite different in each one. My first example would be what I just simply call a local plant. Now for this I would see, and this is our experience here, um, that they're being planted but really still staying close enough to be part of something bigger, to be so strongly connected um, and close, if you like, in its proximity, that um, it's, it's, it, there's a strong sense of connection. It's a local one. Now, what I would say about pace here is I think these kind of plants can happen relatively quickly, um, especially if there are people on the ground already in those kind of places. Um, uh, we in a we're in a city, small city of Derby. It's not a large city, but um, 250,000. Just outside is a small town, about five miles out, called Belper. And uh, so when we planted into Belper, uh, it came about because we had a few people in Belper, and they started to come along. And uh, we said, no, no, don't you move into us. You stay there, and we'll come and plant where you are. And we can actually do that really quite quickly because um, because it was local and so on. So the preparation, it simply needed a few people on the ground. It needed us to have a heart for it, um, and it needed some kind of team. 
we were looking for a leader, but actually we could even carry leadership into there for a season whilst it, it happened. All we needed for them to do was to be meeting there on the ground. The plant itself was actually then beginning to gather there, form a bit of community, others beginning to move in around it. And if I can say this one at this point, I'll say this for this point, but I will say it for um, for all of the plants, um, particularly what I would say is our conviction these days, that if we are not planting churches to reach the lost, <laughs> then I would I would begin to question some motives in it. So right in its conception, right at the beginning, we would say even before you've launched, begin your outreach, begin your mission, begin your evangelistic activities. Um, it, I guess there was a time when we were going, the answer to the, the question is, is the church plan successful or not, is just how many have we gathered. We are asking more questions than that, a lot more diligently these days. And uh, far more um, important to us really is how many baptisms are taking place? <laughs> how many salvations are we seeing? How many people's lives are we touching and connecting with? Not just are we gathering a few more people, but are we reaching other people's lives? We planted a, um, a new church a year ago into, into Nottingham. And um, I was just talking with uh, the guy who's leading that plant. And, uh, and I said, so go on, tell me, I've, I've been listening to what's been going on in one year. Um, how many baptisms have you had? He said, we've had 10 baptisms in the first year. And um, that's really before we've gone very public. Um, so that's a strong encouragement, I believe, for us as church planters, that the heart of our call to plant churches is that right in the heart of the DNA, uh, right in the centre of the beginning of it, in seed, if you like, is a call to be evangelistic and to be reaching the lost. Okay? So then the third stage of this would be the launch and... Um, and where it begins to be public and begins to be known and identifiable uh, and so on within that area. So a local plant, that's how it would work. Now, I think giving actual figures or times is it's a bit tricky, but if I was to say, I think a plant like this, what pace could we run this at? I think within six months, something could be up and running. The point is about this kind of plant, it's relatively low risk. Um, it's a place where relatively there should be high support and really it's an opportunity where I would say hey let's, let's just have a go, let's give people a chance to have a go. Um, six months is a kind of you know finger in the air kind of thing, uh, could be less. Uh, I like to think that, that we don't have to think that church plants take all take a huge long time of build up and take ages, that we could get some things that are happening more rapidly. Let me give a second example. Uh, and this one I would call an indigenous plant or a separate church. That's definitely a kind of an idea of a further away, more um, autonomy in that church with a more of a, a need to stand alone and inevitably needing a more self-sufficient kind of leader, somebody who really could um, be really resilient and a bit more of a self-sufficient one. Now, the pace of this one I think changes a little bit. Uh, I think these kind of plants need a bit more consideration. They are higher risk, particularly as you begin to talk about movement of people, moving from one place to another, families particularly and so on. There's a there's a greater sense of, um, of needing to consider the different stages. So, the big one here, I think, is that the, the pace of preparation probably needs to be extended. Um, and I would say that goes right from the word go, from where the vision to plant comes from, uh, where, how that's birthed. And we, we couldn't put a strong enough emphasis on, on prayer, um, on responding to prophetic words from God, um, on um, catching something from God about then the selection of team and leader, a team leader, and putting a very clear sense of definition and focus. Where are we going to? Why are we going there? 
what's the catchment for that? What's that about? Possibly this would need a stronger team than the one we previously talked about, our first example. And inevitably, I think, would need some kind of actual physical movement. So the build-up to this, I would say, would be a bit longer. And the sense of support from the sending church would need to be definitely captured by them. So then the plant itself, itself would be the move into the area, the beginning to form something, the beginning to, to, um, to that can take time, especially these days we found when you're trying to get people to move and it's not always that straightforward and simple. So that time can need to, can sometimes be extended a little bit where it's a bit of a behind closed doors, um, trying to um, establish something um, quietly at first, if you like. Um, and then I think the launch part then, obviously when that comes, there's a right time. There's just a right time for that to happen. Personally, again, however far away it is, I, I would always love to see that as something of an event, something of a definite point of kickoff. And the Sending Church should be highly supportive at um, just getting behind that. So what would I say about pace here? Well, I'm saying here that I would probably think this is a minimum of a year, um, just depending still on the moves. Um, but I think from beginning to crystallize the idea and the vision for this through to um, actually it being launched, I can't see that really being less than a, than a year's process, possibly could be longer. Okay, let me give you a third example, and this is one that really um, is capturing our hearts more uh, these days. Not that we don't do or want to do those first two kind of plants, but our third kind of plant is, um, is what we would call an apostolic base plant. And this would be one that it would be with the intention from the very beginning that this would be a significant base a significant base that in turn would not just be a good church but would be a planting church and a strong apostolic center. So clearly there's some very different factors here because you're not just looking for a team, you're not just looking for good and willing people, probably first and foremost you're looking for apostolic leadership and those that are um, with some either potential or some experience in that way. This is also, if you like, to understand the pace of this, I would suggest and say that this doesn't just come out of a quick prayer meeting, but it comes out of a key part of an apostolic strategy. And therefore, it's about really getting the right people to send into that situation. So we're talking, I think, primarily about cities, or we're talking about uh, towns that have got significant um, influence in, in an area. I wouldn't want to limit things to say that there were place, other places that couldn't be apostolic bases, but I think there needs to be a sufficient catchment for what we're perhaps envisioning here. So how does this work for us and you know, what's the preparation? Well, the preparation really, I think, is it comes out of an apostolic strategy and a lot of it probably would need to be doing with a lot of vision casting into the church or churches that are linked together. I think we need to be very strong about this. God has spoken. God has put something in our hearts to do this. So when we planted into Leicester four years ago, it was exactly this kind of example. We felt that God had said to us, we needed to plant into Leicester, but it wasn't going to be a little local one. It wasn't going to be a, uh, a, a just a town. It, this was going to be a, an apostolic base plant. And so the leadership that we chose was part of our senior leadership team that were currently with us. Uh, we had a clear sense that this was part of our apostolic strategy to reach into and around the East Midlands. And there are three key cities in the East Midlands that make up the heart of it, Derby, Leicester and Nottingham. There's great things going on in all those cities, but that should never be a deterrent for us planting churches, I don't believe. So the preparation, I believe, that for this one was particularly long 
and it was quite um, drawn out. We needed people to really get something from God here. The plant itself actually took longer than we expected it to, and that was a, a moving issue for people, for individuals who were looking to move in, and uh, it really was quite a challenge, actually, and there were various points where we had to call the church to prayer and even take up offerings, etc., to try to release some people who needed to go to go. So that got kind of a, a, a drawn out thing. So the pace of this was definitely longer and more drawn out. Um, by the time we got to the launch, which was uh, four years ago, our build-up had been going on for three years. Now, not advocating that as a, as, a, as, a, as a statement, but I do think we are talking probably about a couple of years minimum build-up to this sort of plant. Um, I have to say, although it's long and drawn out, for us, th this is worth waiting for. It's kind of the bit that it's worth going for because what we're looking to do here is to plant churches that become apostolic bases that in turn plant churches. So immediately we've planted our church in Leicester. That in the last four years has gone into three different uh, locations itself. Um, with a, Again, we're not just looking at numbers of gathering, we're looking at um, baptisms people that are being reached, communities that are being touched, lives that are being changed. Okay, wind this up a little bit now. So the answer to the question, how do you pace a church plant? And the answer is going to be, there are different paces for different plants. And I would like to think that there's some, um, some um, pace and speed and um, rapidity that we can do in some planting. Love to see sort of chains of churches being planted rapidly, but there are also other sorts of plants that are going to take longer. Okay, my final thoughts. Um, so whilst there is an urgency and a keenness to get going, and I know someone like Colin Barron totally falls into that category, it could be said that it is better to take a bit more time to get it right. And uh, so whilst I'm kind of impatient, I think we, one of the things we've learned is that if what we want is a sustainable plant, um, the thought of planting churches that won't be there again in five years' time doesn't feel very satisfying. Uh, we planted 30 years ago into Derby. Uh, recently, myself and other church leaders were saying, we counted up at least 20 churches that had been planted in Derby in that time that aren't here anymore. In other words, people have planted them, they've not survived. I would just say that I think what we would like to do is to plant churches that have got sustainability in them. So if it's worth waiting to get it right, then there's a sense of just hold the pace back a little bit for that reason. Second final thought, which is it's worth waiting for the right people. And um, we do need people who are resilient. Church planting is not easy. There are lots of challenges, lots of costs. I have to say it is hugely rewarding as well, but we do need to, to be training and preparing uh, resilient people who are the right people to be planting into those things. Uh, final thought, um, and it's just a thought about momentum, because once momentum starts to grow, it is a lot easier, I believe, to pick up the pace. And that's as simple as just the, the kind of idea that planting from static, from having not done something before, planting from a culture that's not used to it, is like beginning to push a car. You kind of just starting to, you have to get a lot of energy and weight behind it to get some pace going. Uh, once you've got a sense of momentum, the pace can begin to increase. And so our time frames that I've given could begin to reduce and reduce once there's a culture in place, once there's a momentum in place, and once we uh, have got some things moving. Well, there's a few thoughts. I'm not sure if they are totally appropriate to every situation. I hope they're just some stimulus anyway, and I hope they add in to the, um, the training and the conversations that you've been having. Um, happy to just now consider some questions um, over to Hannah, I think.
Brilliant, Mark. Wow. Um, I've totally made loads of notes, so this is really exciting. And um, we've got quite a few questions have come in as well. Um, none, we, we've actually got a question from Brazil, which is Colin Barron himself, who says hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, hi. <laughs> really enjoyed the comments that you've made about him. Uh, and he's a man that definitely likes to get things up and running quickly. So, um, okay, so, so let, let me have a little look through the questions. I'm trying to, um, some of them will be related to pace, um, and I think some of them are general questions that people are just wanting to pick your brains about. So we've obviously got a bit of a mixed bag. Right, So, um, okay, fantastic. First question then. Um, Mark, how do we help the church plant leader to pace their own, is that right? Their own life so they don't burn out? I think that's right. Wow, good question. Um, I think those of us that are, um, if you like, in some kind of apostolic role or behind them or acting as a senior leader to them, I think we have some responsibility to help them pace themselves. I've had one or two people who are, they are like heat-seeking missiles. They want to get going now, they want to do it now. They, if they're married and have children, they would leave them behind to go. Uh, or they would, you know. So I think there's a little bit about responsibility does fall to those of us who are taking a heart, uh, some sort of responsibility for them, to to say, like guys, we want you to to set a, a, a sustainable pace for what is doable. One of my concerns about church planting is that sometimes, if there is a cost, it is often the children of families that go. They're the ones that really don't quite get the vision and so on. They're the ones that lose their friends, etc. So I think there's a there's a um, importance there to, to, to help people to say, let's not just go at the pace that we want to go at. Let's go at the pace that either my family unit or those around me, whatever, can do. I do feel there's a sense of responsibility on the individual themselves as well to um, just not to try to bite off too much too soon. And one of our, you know, purposes of saying, um, get the plant going, but don't go public to start with, is to allow them to actually create a pace that is, whilst you're in a new place, um, that is um, that's acceptable, that's that's palatable, that's that's acceptable. So, um, once you set that, you. The temptation then is we're launching. We've got to do everything. And again, we would say. Don't do lots of things. Do a few things and do them as well as you can. Uh, that's probably good advice you've had from others as well, though, as well. So that's just a few thoughts off the top of my head. Is it okay? Yeah, super. Really, really good. Thank you. Um, this is one that's not not about pace, but it's about because you obviously looked about. Obviously, you've separated it into the preparation plant and the launch. How many people do you look for in in a plant in order to launch? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, and again, probably oh, those three examples I gave, I probably would look for more on each one. So, because um, they start to become more and more um, ambitious, if you like, the further up the scale we go. So, um, I I think uh, a launch in a local locality, whether it's a suburb of a city, whether it's a, a, a village or a small town, do you know what? I think 20 to 25 people and so on. I think you just want to do enough to create community that can be a worshipping community and a, um, and a caring community could be enough. Um, if we were planting further away, I probably would push that number up a little bit. I'd say I would want to launch with probably more like 40 uh, or more. Now, this sounds ambitious, but if we're planting into a city, I would say I would shoot for 50 people to go and to start. Um, as a network of churches, we've just planted into Leeds, and uh, we planted there with 30, and the guys on the ground there are saying, we could just have done with that little bit more critical mass when you're trying to be in a city. The good thing about their plan into, into Leeds is that the 30 are all, oh, they just, every one of them looks to be um, strong, um, gifted <laughs> up for it, so it's actually a strong plant, not just by the number, but by the uh, the quality, if you like, and the experience of the people. So I think there's a numbers game, but there's also a sense of the strength of people that you've got in that. Um, 
you could have 25 people, but you could have 15 absolute real rock solid people, and I'd say that's 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 good to go so in, in most places. So I don't know if that answers that question well enough, but as I say, there's going to be a, a variance there. Um, I I also feel though that if you've if ascending church is actually helping the church to launch, there is the possibility, especially with close proximity, that people from the ascending church can be added into it for quite a little time to give it extra strength as well. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that, and that's very helpful because you've obviously apportioned it, you know, to your three examples there. Um, so they're interested in the launch. This is this is great. So somebody else is asking, um, what does the launch involve? And again, that will probably look a bit different for each of those examples. But what do you do? Okay, well, I can tell you what we do, and again, it's not always the same, so it's going to be a bit of variety. But I I probably need to say at this point that. Um, there are many other wonderful, amazing churches, networks, groupings around the country that would do things a little bit differently. Um, there are some churches I know have got great friends who, if they were launching, it would be uh, it would be the whole bang shoot. It would be fireworks, smoke, lights, and we're in town. And uh, I love those. I think they're brilliant and wonderful. Uh, it's actually not what we would do. <laughs> um, we would probably do something that's lower, much lower key than that, but was at least a, a defined point for the church itself. Um, there, I mean, one of the launches we've done, I think the one in Leicester, we looked for that to say, we want this to be a launch for our people. We want it to be a launch that the other churches in the city are aware of and invited into so that they can you know and bear in mind the churches in the city have been incredibly welcoming which is a wonderful thing um, but we'd also do some evangelistic activities around it that just said like we used it as a sort of an evangelistic moment and so that we, whether that was kind of like um, special uh, coffee mornings or evenings or presentations I can't remember exactly what we did but we actually used it as a moment to say we're going to um, just put ourselves on the map a little bit and use it as an evangelistic moment to uh, to milk that moment. Um, I think this is a little bit a, a question of simply uh, resources and and almost like what's your style and taste, if you like, in this thing. Um, interestingly, our most recent plant in Nottingham, they. Um, really wanted to keep it relatively low key, and the reason for that is because the heart and and passion for the leader is that he would like to build this church, as he says, not from the top down, not from here's a big church or here's a here's a church here now come and join it, but he wants to build this church from the bottom up, and that means that they have not got regular Sunday meetings yet, even now, even though they've been going a year. They've done a, a relatively small launch, this one, um, but they put much more of their resources into what they call missional communities and uh, reaching uh, lost people. I think the result of that is they've got less people attending, uh, although they still have about 70, 80 or so um, coming to the meetings, but they have got a higher proportion, like I say, 10 baptisms in the first year, I think that sounds pretty good and where I would like it to go. So you can see that the launch business is it's a little bit varied. There is still, I think, an important moment for the church's sake to say, we're going now. We're not hidden. We're not behind closed doors. We're up and running now, um, however that works. So I hope that's helpful. Sorry, waiting to be unmuted there. No, very helpful indeed. Um, back on pace then, we've got a couple of questions that have come in about that, which is obviously the topic of, of the evening. What differences have you noticed in how younger or older leaders approach pace and what advice do you have for them? Good one. Yeah. Well, well speaking as a younger leader still, I obviously have all that to look forward to. Uh, um, Yes, um, it is a good question. I, I don't know quite <laughs> what advice. I think that um, there were just a couple of interesting things there at the moment. There, there's an interesting category of people these days who are the early retirers. So they were counters older, 
Um, but they're an interesting category of people because they're becoming available. They're still young enough to really want to do something with the rest of their life. Possibly they've got a mobility uh, if they're not looking for um, you know, work in the same way. And so, interestingly, they can move a lot quicker. You'd think that the younger you are, you want to move quicker, older, you want to sort of slow things down. But actually, I think there's a number of people there that can move quite quickly because they've got less um, things tying them down to their locality. Uh, I think it's hard for younger people to be that mobile these days. Um, so to them, I would say, be patient. <laughs> to, be, to, be, to be patient because it's worth it to get it right. It's worth it to get it in the right timing. Um, it's worth it to, you know, it's going to be a step of faith, whatever you do. It's going to be, a, it is going to be an amazing faith step. Um, and uh, so you want to be together in it. If you're a family or a couple, whatever, uh, you want to be absolutely, you want to be really together. Your faith is in this together, and there's going to be a sort of a faith cost. But I think, um, uh, I would say, you know, just to be, um, to, to, to learn to be uh, just patient and wait for the right things, but make the faith steps at the right time. Uh, I could give an example really just at the moment. My, my own uh, son and daughter-in-law, they've got two children. They have moved to be part of this new church plant I've mentioned in Leeds. And um, they uh, were um, uh, previously in Manchester and they were kind of waiting and waiting. And they were beginning to get more and more frustrated and um, so we were kind of like saying, look, you just got to keep praying, keep trusting God, um, don't give up your job just yet and so on. But in the right time, you're going to need to make the right faith step. And sure enough, this, uh, this summer, um, they have still had to make a step. Uh, that was a move without jobs being totally fixed up and everything. But, um, but it was nonetheless a, a, a right timing for them. They then said, God, it went an awful lot easier than we expected it to in the end, and the move has been uh, better than we thought. So, um, again, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm actually answering exactly the right question, but my advice generally would be stay in faith, <laughs> look for the right moment to make faith steps, and there is a time when you have to seize that moment and go for it. But in the meantime, be patient. Just be patient that if God's called you, he's going to get you there and it'll be worth it to get there in the right time. Very good. No, that's excellent. So if you need to come back to me on that, okay. Yeah, no, I think, I think you have answered that very well. There's some different challenges for, like you say, different generations with different responsibilities there. Um, we've got a question here, which is this one. Uh, when a church plant is going really slowly, what advice do you have for working out whether to pull the plug on it? Obviously, you talked about some churches that have stopped. Um, or dig in for the long haul, so uh, experience of it being really quite hard going. Yeah, well two, two examples come straight to my mind of what we've done. Uh, one was this long distance plant into Glasgow. Um, you know there is something, there's something about the whole thing about going to plant the church anyway where nobody wants to give up. And um, uh, what, what we found there was that um, We'd, we tried all sorts of ways to say, you know, nobody wants to give up, and I think it, pulling the plug is a kind of last, last um, um, option. Um, we had to pull that plug on that one in the end because we were worried, deeply worried about the health of the lead couple. And because there was no other leaders really looking to present themselves or come up alongside in, um, and be uh, supportive uh, to them in the way that they needed, in the end, we just came to them and said, "Look, we're not telling you to, but what do you what do you feel?" And they just said, "We just don't think we can carry on." So they, they're very, very sad moments. And actually, interestingly, the the effect of that goes on a lot longer than you'd expect. People live with the 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 sense of something that's not worked or something they lost. So I, I do feel that pulling the plug is you know. So I would say that if you if it's struggling and struggling long. The thing to do is to bring apostolic, prophetic input into it just to keep saying, what do we need to do to, to, to get some energy going into this, to get some life going into it? What sort of input is needed? What sort of investment? Is there somebody else that can come in? 
Um, so that that's one example. Another example was one that we had, which was relatively close to us. It was part of our area church here, and um, we had a group of people that were in a small town, uh, not too far from Derby, but just a bit further out than you'd really like. <laughs> um, and um, people were starting to come from that from that uh, town, so we began to form first of all a cell group, a small group, and and then we kind of said, "Great, we're ready to go. Let's launch it." Um, because it was fragile, again we had 20 to 30 people, but I think it's actually there. If I can say it here on this <laughs> in this situation, uh, the quality of people and their commitment levels were not there necessary to make it work. And so again, what we ended up with was two or three really diligent, great-hearted leaders who were pouring their heart and life into it, who all have full-time jobs that they were still working with, who in the end just got to the point of saying, we just can't do this anymore. And um, we felt very frustrated at that point that we didn't have somebody else that we could send in. We were um, stuck really at that point. And again, we felt like with great sadness, we had to say, let's just close it because uh, that's what we do. So I think the the answer to that is um, is that um, where a church is struggling, I think it's it's uh, it's beholden to the relationship into sending church network apostolic leadership to come in and look at it proactively and say, what are the things that we can do here? What can we do? If we gave this kind of input, would that help to lift it? Yeah. If we could inject something else in, would that help it? Um, I just would say it's worth fighting for it. Even if you have to say to the church plant, scale it down, stop meeting every Sunday, meet every second Sunday, do things that actually make it a bit more manageable because it might be able to grow again. I would say do what you can to pair it back and try to keep it alive because um, um, because that's it is worth it. It's worth it. Okay. Yeah. Well, that that's brilliant. It leads nicely onto this one because you're talking about managing the pace in terms of scaling back if it's really hard going, and there may be some similarities in this one. Um, what advice would you give to a church plant leader who's holding down a hard job? So you've obviously got someone that's working and obviously got quite a challenging job in terms of pace. There might be yeah some similarities there. There are some similarities. I'll probably say some similar things. Um, yeah, we've got several of these, or, or different ones in different places that I can immediately think of. And um, yeah, the, the challenge obviously is that um, leading a church does whatever, you, whether you're full-time, part-time, or not paid at all and got another job, it is still a consuming job. It's a consuming role. So if you're trying to do that in your spare time, um, I, well, number one is I would look to, if we could, try to find some way to release some time for that for, for the leader because I think it's a, uh, it is such a challenge to do to do that from a full time job. Um, but if they are in full time um, occupation and they're planting a church, uh, the keys must be try not to do too many things, try not to launch too many projects. Um, Churches are notorious for starting things and usually responding to an immediate need. Let's start a CAP course. Now let's start a, uh, a recovery class. Now let's start a whatever. And then, and then we can't sustain them and we don't know how to stop them. Um, interestingly, our church in Leicester, as we planted it, the leader there, he said to me, I've got a pretty strong conviction here that we should not start any full church um, single ministries, if you like, a ministry that the whole church is expected to be behind. He said, what I want to do is build more around the missional communities, and they're not allowed to start any project that they can't run themselves. That's, that's totally sustainable for them. So what they've ended up with is a number of quite localized uh, community-based projects, but each one of the localized communities owns them and therefore it's sustainable. There are no um, whole church projects there. 
And uh, I was a little bit suspicious about that at first, but actually I've looked at it, I think that's actually quite good advice because it means that those who are owning the little local ones have got um, capacity and grace to do it. Um, to a leader that has still got a full-time job, I would say your leadership must adjust so that it is you, you lead through others and you you should be doing that anyway but but in that kind of situation that's what you must do you've got to lead through a team you've got to lead through others and so um, uh, you you're if you're not a team player you're gonna burn yourself out and so it's a skill learning to be a team player if you're not a natural one you've got to learn to delegate to give things away to let people own them and, uh, and not to take them all on yourself. Um, I think I made that error years ago. I've watched others make the error where you feel like I'm the only one who's actually carrying this. I've got to carry it all on my own. And that's where burnout comes about. So I think the, the senior leader has to be disciplined to say, I'm giving it, I'm delegating it, and I've got to give it to others to, uh, to empower. And if they drop the ball, then the ball has to be dropped. I can't be around picking it up all the time. So there is something about pacing yourself in that, uh, to be doing the right things um, and uh, and disciplining yourself not to do not to do everything. I hope that answers that. Yeah, good wisdom. Definitely, we we're living in that kind of situation ourselves. So that's really really very wise and very helpful. Um, we've got a different type of a question here. Uh, I'm conscious of the time, so. Obviously, if there's any other burning questions out there, we, we do have a, a couple here, but um, I, we'll go with this and see if anyone else springs up with, with one that's more pressing. Um, how do you keep up enthusiasm and momentum for planting an apostolic base type of church when the preparation for it is so long? Um, do you know what? I find that easy. I find that so easy. I just think that um, if we are called to be um, to be an apostolic people and if we're called to plant those kind of churches then for me as we're planting one we're looking to the next horizon already thinking what have you got for us next God because we know that that's the context that we're living in that's the place that we're saying this is what we live for this is what we're called to be um, I've, I guess we've drilled that into our church from very early days. Um, little story, when I moved to take on this little church, it was a kind of fledgling little fellowship and I was just young and so naive. But it was called Giltbrook Christian Fellowship. Now Giltbrook is like about 10 houses. It's like from the zebra crossing to the to the traffic lights. And even people who lived in Gilbrook didn't know it was there. It was like it's like so parochial, so kind of like small. And I don't know what it was, but when we started to move in and, and we kind of like to built a new leadership, we said we need a new name. And the name should express our vision. So at that time, um, well I joked with them afterwards, I said I wanted to call the church Western Europe Christian Fellowship because like ah, come on that's our vision we we're only 25 people but that's it we ended up calling ourselves East Midlands Christian Fellowship and interestingly we've still got the same banner if you like name today because we felt that God had called us not to one place certainly not one little tiny location but gospel of the kingdom so that and so for me it's like you build and you build and you're actually waiting for it and you're waiting for God to bring enough into place into the church to have grown sufficiently or to have the right people to be able to do it and then you sense a trigger and I think that's a fantastic feeling when we got to planting Leicester it was like we've been building for this for ages but because it's our deep rooted call there's no lack of enthusiasm about it. It's actually, it, it kind of builds, it's sort of crescendo. And so when we actually get, we got it to go, there's a sense of um, sort of almost like, you know, trigger being pulled, fantastic. And as soon as it's off and running, we're going, and what have you got for us next, God? You see, because it's, a, so whilst it might appear to have a very long um, build up, 
um, I think because we're trying to take the whole church with it, let me believe, believe me, our church thinks we're going, you know, we're going, still going, well, you're not talking about another one. Yes, we are. Um, so I appreciate that it might appear on paper and certainly to younger people, gosh, is that, is that a long, that's a long time. To us, I think it actually is, a, but I think as a church leader, you can't afford to let it come off the, off the boil. You can't let it come off the pace. I would look to make sure we're preaching or introducing or having testimony or some things um, regularly into the church that says, remember, this is what we're here for. This is what we're about. Um, and so when we do this, this is what we're doing. We're doing exactly what God's called us to. So I haven't got a lot of sympathy to say, do you go off the boil? No, we don't. And I shouldn't, and I don't think we should. I think if that's the big call that God's called us to, um, you know, that I, I'm, and, and I don't think the place, I do not think this, the country is, is saturated. I think there are so much, there's so much more yet still to be done as long as 90% of our population is not going to church, is unreached. We need, we need to be planted all of those kind of churches and more. Right um, yeah. <laughs> I'm with you. Um, no, that's brilliant. Right. We, we've got a couple more minutes. And so if this one, we'll just make this one a brief and we'll make this our final question then because it is about it is all relevant to what you've been saying. If you're moving to three locations within three years, how do you manage the wisdom of not appointing leaders too early, i.e. if the church is mainly growing by mission? So this is about the, the, the pacing of appointing leaders. Yeah. Uh, wow, that's a, that's a good question because I, you actually part of what you'd like to dream is that your future leaders are actually in the harvest; they're not even saved yet. So uh, you don't want to kind of go in with such a sort of fixed setup package. So I I'm a little slower these days in establishing defined leadership teams quickly. Um, the leader needs to be clear. The leader knows need to know who they're broadly working with and uh, have a team with them around that. But I would suggest that it's um, it's probably not wise to, to set in leaders too quickly. When first, first of all, the first thing that could happen is some people could not actually make it with the church plant. We've had some of that where people look like they're very in and keen and ready and up for it and then they kind of fade somehow. So. Uh, uh, you want to give it a little bit of time to see who really is there, who's really committed. And secondly, you want to see who else God's going to add in, because God can add in some new people. Again, what's happened in our Nottingham plant, uh, we sent people thinking some would be leaders, and it's not actually what it's turned out to be. Some new people have come in and very quickly have picked up our DNA, picked up the heart for this, and you're thinking, actually, you're, you're rapidly becoming part of the new leaders. So the answer to that I think is simply not to do it too quickly, but um, the, the main leader does need to know that they've got people around them who are working with them and so on, and the, and the main leader needs to be clear I think in that. I hope that answers that. Question. Superb. I, I think that absolutely does and Mark, um, it's just been great having you with us. Is there if you, if you had 30 seconds to just encourage us, leave us with one word before I just wrap up, is there any, uh, anything else you wish to say to all those listening in that are either church planting or are planning to church plant? Okay, uh, only this. I, my, my, I sometimes say, what's our goal? You're a church leader, what's your goal? And some people, they say, oh, it's a big church. And I go, how big? How big is the goal? And I, I would suggest that the answer to the question, what's the goal? is not just a large church, or God, God bless us with those. It's movement, it's actually a sense of movement. Uh, a missiologist said to me once, the fruit of church is another church. And I would like just to say that, that I think every time we plant, every time we plant a church, I would like to say that right in its very beginnings, in that, in that church, there's a seed of another church. And um, if we can understand that, that what really will be transforming for our society and for our nation and so on isn't just a few more churches but is a movement where you know whatever the size actually whatever the size there's a sense of every church has got another church in it and every time we plant one there's a seed of something else in there i i think that's one of the most exciting things to think about um about for the future let's think about movements that's what i would say yeah. 
really brilliant. Fantastic encouragement to finish. Mark, um, it's just been a real privilege to have you with us. So um, as we come to the end of this broadcast, just want to thank you on behalf of everyone listening in and on behalf of people that will obviously be picking this up later off the broadcast network. So hugely appreciate. Uh, and, and thank you to all who are tuning in and all those that have listened and asked questions and been part of this kind of conversation. Um, what we have to say is that uh, obviously there'll be dates coming out soon for the 2017 uh, webinars and hangouts and, and podcasts and all sorts of exciting things coming up next year. So please um, put your name down if you haven't already on the email on the uh, on the network uh, website and you can stay linked in. We uh, do know that next year, the beginning of next year, we're going to be having Liam Thatcher, Andy McCulloch and Simon Holly amongst others to share and spend time with us so you can get your questions ready for them. Um, I just want to say that also the uh, church planting 24 hours away is also the dates are there so when you get your 2017 diary the 20th and the 21st of October 2017 when we are planning to spend some time away together in Northamptonshire so uh, those are just things to uh, get excited about for next year and uh, until then God bless you all and uh, have a really fantastic kind of December have a great Christmas have a good rest enjoy celebrating Jesus and we will see you again next year thanks all thank you mark bless you thank you hannah and uh, hope that's been helpful but it's been great to be part of it thank you very much super see you again yeah thank you bye then bless you bye, -bye. bye.